these words from the prophet Isaiah calling us to worship this morning. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I have called you by name. You are mine. Because we are called by God together, we approach the throne of grace with confidence and we rise together and sing to the good and gracious King. Thank you. 
welcomes us to this place with these words, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, the peace of Christ be with you. you. Congregation may be seated. Holy, holy Lord God Almighty, good and gracious King. As we enter into this place and we gather as a congregation, we sing those words and we recognize, of course, the ways in which we fail to live in light of that good and gracious King. The way that we fail to live good lives, the way that we fail to be gracious with ourselves and with one another. And so we find this need to come clean before God, to be honest about our sin. And we do that through the prayer of confession that's printed in our bulletins this morning. The words will also be on the screen. We invite you to pray with your eyes open as together we confess our sin. God with us, you took on flesh and bone in the person of Jesus, calling us to come and follow in your way. We confess that we would prefer for you to come with us to follow us to bless the path we have already chosen. Too often you are found in places we would rather avoid, with people we are afraid of, doing things we wish you wouldn't. Too often your way requires our sacrifice. Your journey challenges our motives. Your path upsets our assumptions. So we come, open to your Spirit's transformational power within us. Forgive our inward vision. Give us courage to follow after you, to invite others along on the journey, and to walk this life with our eyes set on you. In your name we pray. Amen. Our assurance of forgiveness comes to us through song we sing together, yet not I, but through Christ in me, the congregation may stand if you wish. Mm-hmm. 
forgiven people. Let's go forth to live in that peace. And all God's people said, amen. The congregation may be seated. And as we turn our hearts to hear from God, we've approached God. As we turn to hear from God, we begin with a children's message this morning from Lizzie Rice, our director of children's and middle school formation. Did you know we are in a new season? No, it's not spring yet, unfortunately. And it's definitely not summer outside. Did you know we have different seasons here at church? We have seasons at church like Advent and Christmas, and soon it will be Easter. And we even have a season called Ordinary Time. Hmm. Right now, we are in the season called Lent. L-E-N-T. Lent is the season at church before Easter. The season begins on Ash Wednesday. Have you heard of that before? Ash Wednesday? Maybe you came to church that night and got ashes put on your forehead or in your, on your hand in the shape of a cross. We heard the words from ash to ash and dust to dust, you belong to Jesus. Hmm. During Lent, we think and talk and hear a lot about Jesus. We journey with Jesus to the city of Jerusalem. We hear about Jesus healing, teaching, and even eating. Lent is the season we remember that the journey of Jesus makes to Jerusalem before Easter. And during Lent, we remember what it means to be human. We are reminded that we are not God. We remember that to be human means to get hungry, <laughs> to feel emotions. We remember that we need sleep and that we need love and that we need each other. So as we listen to the stories of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem this Lent season, listen to the stories of people, well, being people. Listen to how Jesus eats with people, how Jesus speaks with others, how they walk together, and listen for how Jesus shows love to all people. Thank you, Lizzie. Throughout this Lenten sermon series, we are focusing, we're traveling with Jesus throughout Mark's gospel in the final week of his life. We've called it the journey. And so our song of preparation each and every week will be this song we introduced last week. We are people on a journey. The congregation may stand if you wish to see the, sing the first verse. <laughs> Oh God, we are people on a journey following after you. God made flesh in Jesus. In this word, your example, show us your heart that we may walk in love. In your word, this example, show us your truth that we may walk with courage. And in your word, your example, show us your vision that we may walk with purpose. Guide our steps, O oh God, as we follow in your path of service in the world today, tomorrow, and every day. And together, as God's people, we say, Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
So this season of Lent, as Lizzie reminded us, we're on a journey, the journey of Jesus to the cross. We are stopping at a couple of different places along the way. Last week, we listened in and learned from Jesus as he entered the city of Jerusalem on a donkey amidst a crowd calling, Hosanna, save us. And today, today we stop at the temple, house of God. Let's listen to the word of the Lord from Mark, chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. Then they, that being the disciples and Jesus, came to Jerusalem. And Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money chamber changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. Jesus then began teaching, saying, Is it not written? My house shall be called a house of prayer for all people, but you have made it a cave for robbers. And when the chief priests and the scribes heard this, they kept looking for a way to kill Jesus, for they were afraid of him because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples left the city. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For over a decade, Jameson Bachman lived as a serial squatter in other people's homes. A squatter being someone who moves onto other people's property without legal right or payment. In 2018, a New York Magazine article written by William Brennan recounted the stories of just a few of the dozen people who came forward to share their experiences as victims of Jameson's squatting schemes. Stories like Melissa Frost, who thought she was giving temporary shelter to a Hurricane Sandy survivor who had lost everything when she let Jameson into her home in 2012. He started out as a cordial, polite person, somewhere in his 50s, who acted like an appreciative guest and then began avoiding any question of moving on to a more permanent place of his own until she realized he had no intention of moving out of her home. Using his intricate knowledge of tenancy, tenancy and squatter laws to stay one step ahead of her in what she came to eventually understand as his attempt to get her to move out of her own house leaving it completely to him. At first, he just scuffed up the floors. Then he took the doors off the hinges and hid them. Then he clogged the toilets with cat litter and found other ways to sabotage the home. But over time, his behavior escalated to the point that he took her cat to a kill shelter where it was put down before she could claim it. Eventually, he stopped leaving the house altogether, having everything he needed delivered, so she couldn't even change the locks to prevent him from returning. Melissa approached him to try to negotiate a peaceful exit to pay him to move out of the house he had taken over to help him find a new place to stay, and he just cackled, saying, this is my house now. Then... In 2017, 60-year-old Jameson answered Alex Miller's Craigslist ad for a roommate, claiming to be someone named Jed Creek in need of a short-term rental, paying one month's rent up front and moving into her Philadelphia home that same day. He never paid rent again or a dime for shared utilities, but he did habitually remove all the light bulbs from the common spaces so that the house was constantly shadowed in darkness. He took apart her furniture when she wasn't home. He moved things around her room when she wasn't there. He vibrated around the house with hostility. Alex recounts the day her mother, Susan, showed up to confront him. Susan stormed into the house, unannounced, with a out-even knocking, and Jameson ran at her, yelling, Get out of my house! And her mother 
stood her ground unflinchingly and said, this isn't your house. This is my daughter's house. Before he was eventually removed by police. This isn't your house. This is my daughter's house. In what I'm sure you will consider a bizarre analogy, <laughs> something very similar was happening in that temple court scene described in Mark's gospel when Jesus said, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all people, but you have made it a cave for robbers. Which is actually more accurately translated something like, but you have made it a hideout for those hostile to God. Of course, this particular house of reference wasn't an updated home in a quaint Philadelphia neighborhood. Rather, this house Jesus referred to was God's house, more commonly referred to as the temple, found overlooking the city of Jerusalem, the very temple Jesus stood in as he proclaimed these words. And to understand this moment in Jesus' journey to the cross, the significance of this moment, these words, we must better understand the temple first. And to, to do that, we have to go back back to before the temple even existed. All the way back, actually, to the time Moses, Miriam, and Aaron led God's people out of slavery under the Egyptians. You see, God's people, you might remember, went from slaves in someone else's land to nomads with no land at all, wandering around in the wilderness. And this endless wandering made God's people antsy and anxious and forgetful. They seemed to forget, forget God, and especially that they were people in covenant with God, that covenant that God made with their ancestors, Abraham and Sarah, saying something like, I will bless you so that all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. This covenant is for you and for all generations after you. So in response, to the people's forgetfulness as they were wilderness wandering, God confirmed the covenant with this wandering people, the covenant in which God's ultimate goal was to bless all peoples of the earth. And as part of that confirmation of the covenant, that reminder, God instructed the people to build a symbol, a symbol, a reminder of this covenant blessing for all people called the Ark of the covenant. Wherever they wandered, the Ark of the Covenant, the symbol of God's blessing for all people, it wandered with them so that they would not forget it. Now time passed. Leadership changed hands, and their wilderness wandering came to an end when God led people, the people to a more permanent residence, to the promised land of their own. And then finally, Hundreds of years after Moses oversaw the building of the Ark of the Covenant that was still with them, that mobile reminder of God's blessing to all people that they always had among them, then finally, King Solomon oversaw the building of the temple. And the house of God finally shows up on the scene in the sacred city of this promised land, Jerusalem. The symbol of God's covenant to bless all people essentially became not just an ark, but a giant, immovable compound bigger than a football field with multiple buildings and courtyards scattered around it, a prominent reminder to all citizens of Jerusalem and pilgrims traveling to the sacred city of God's covenant blessing for everyone through them. And... and this temple, God's house, it wasn't just to serve as a quaint reminder of this covenant, but the co temple compound itself was designed to be used by all people with specific commands to include those considered outsiders and outcasts, non-Jews and foreigners, women, servants, orphans, widows, the needy, and more. King Solomon himself, 
even specifically invited non-Jews to the inauguration of God's house. And later, after God's house had been destroyed and then rebuilt, the largest area of the temple compound, the part that took up the very most space and could hold the very most people, was called the court of Gentiles, the court of the outsider and the outcast, the very court that Jesus stood in as he spoke to the crowd that day. In other words, the temple, God's house, was designed as a place of welcome and hospitality, a place to gather in all people. As is so often the case, God's intentions, God's purposes, the way things were supposed to be were twisted and deluded by human agendas, intentions of power, and purposes of privilege. Eventually, religious leaders and devout followers of God cobbled out laws and lives that made the temple not so much God's house as theirs. Not so much a place of God's blessing and welcome for all people, but a place of safety and comfort for them and others like them. A hideout for the hostels of the ways of God. You could say God's house had some squatters. Sure, uh, the squatters were wearing priestly garb, or some were reciting religious law, some squatters were following the right customs and carrying the prophetic scrolls, but they were squatters nonetheless who believed, this is my house now. And then, then one day, like a first century Susan Miller, Jesus made a grand entrance without knocking into the temple. It was in many ways under the possession of squatters at that time. And this grand entrance, it was the kind of entrance that got people's attention. And he stood his ground unflinchingly and said, this isn't your house. This is God's house. Now actually he didn't say just that. But what he did say packed its very own punch because Jesus did what he often did. He borrowed someone else's words, words from the past to speak into the present. He borrowed words spoken long before, the words of the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah already recorded in the Jewish scriptures and our scriptures as he said, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people but you have made it a hideout for those hostile to God's ways. Now, this isn't the entirety of what Jesus said that day. I mean, he simply, as the word told us, began teaching. These words instead are a brief summary, a, a snippet of the teaching as he stood in the court of the Gentiles, the largest gathering space for all the people in the temple. You see, this is a snippet because the author of Mark's gospel didn't need to use up precious parchment and ink to record all the words Jesus spoke since Mark's first hearers and readers would have been able to fill in the gaps. These words were already recorded, after all, recorded by the prophets in the books of Isaiah and Jeremiah. These words were already written. These being the words of the prophet Isaiah, found in Isaiah 56, proclaiming, Thus says the Lord, Maintain justice and do what is right. Happy is the one who does this, the one who holds fast to my ways, the strangers and the foreigners who come before me. I will bring them to my holy mountain. I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. I will bring in and welcome them. This is the word of the Lord God who gathers the outcasts. Jesus took those words, those words from the prophet Isaiah, 
And then he intertwined them with these words of the prophet Jeremiah, found in Jeremiah 7. Thus says the Lord, I have told you, act justly. Do not oppress the alien, the orphan, the widow, or shed innocent blood, but you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, go after other gods, and then you come into my house and say, we are safe here. And this house, which is called by my name, has become a den of robbers, a hideout for those hostile to my ways. Two different prophets. Two different prophets long ago, speaking to God's people at two very different times, to two very different groups of people, actually, who needed the exact same reminder. The temple, God's house, was intended to reflect God's covenant as a place of blessing and welcome and gathering and hospitality for all people. So it turned out that Jesus, Jesus wasn't the first one to find squatters in God's house. The prophet Isaiah and the prophet Jeremiah found them too. Theologian Paula Fontana Quayles writes, the purpose of the temple is defined clearly in the prophet Isaiah's words. It is a symbol of the covenant relationship, a house of justice and blessing and welcome for all people, including the stranger, the foreigner, the widow, the orphan, and the other outcasts of the day. And Jeremiah's words call out those who participate in the temple practices and even proclaim God's word, but whose daily lives do not reflect the heart of God's covenant purposes. So Jesus steps into the temple and finds the same old problem, and he takes the risk to call it out once again. And Paula concludes, a risk that ultimately leads him straight to the cross. Because it is this moment, in particular, that has the religious leaders doubling down on their effort to kill Jesus. When it would have been easier, safer, more comfortable to remain silent, Jesus speaks up. He challenges the way of things. He brings to light the thing more easily, safely, comfortably kept in the darkness. He sees the way things are, have been for a long time, long, long time, back to Isaiah and Jeremiah. And he knows it's not God's intent. And he does the difficult, unpopular work of proclaiming this is not the way things are supposed to be. This is God's house for God's blessing. He takes the risk. That risk is ours now. Listening, centuries removed, to that word spoken in the midst of the court of the Gentiles, the court of the outcasts. That risk is ours now. As it turns out, the problems of the past are still the problems of today, aren't they? Just with a new set of outcasts, perhaps. We need this same challenging, repetitive, and often unwelcome word. Of course, we could ask ourselves, is this church a true reflection of God's house, God's welcome, God's hospitality for all people, or is it merely a hideout for our own safety and protection? Does this space, does this ministry here fulfill God's purpose to include those considered outsiders and outcasts of our day and age? Is ARC's building and ministry a true symbol of God's covenant blessing for all people? Those are certainly good questions to ponder. We should think of them. But but to be honest, as we journey with Jesus toward the cross this Lenten season and stop here at this temple moment to learn from him and the prophets he echoed, there is a deeper, truer, and more difficult reflection to be had. More difficult questions to ask. Questions 
that bring us closer to home, so to speak. Not questions about this building and this ministry so much, questions about me, about you, about us, about our very selves and our very lives. As the Apostle Paul writes later to Christians in Corinth, you are God's servants, God's dwelling place, God's house. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? And as God said, I will live with them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. We are the temple of the living God. In other words, we ourselves have become the temple, God's house, the sign and symbol of God's faithful and constant covenant blessing. Just as God's purpose and intent and design for the Ark of the Covenant transferred to the temple so long ago, God's purpose and intent and design for the temple has transferred to us. The way in which the temple was purposed to serve as a community reminder of God's blessing for all people, well, that's our purpose now. The way in which the temple was intended to gather all people together, well, that's our intent now. The way in which God's temple was designed to welcome the outsiders and the outcasts of its day, well, that's our design now. Calling out and repenting of the ways we don't live that blessing out as God intended, that's our challenge now. But it's certainly a risk. And it can come with a cost. Not the same cost as Jesus, who lost his life, but a cost nonetheless. Leaders and staff at Cornerstone Family Church in Des Moines took this risk to hold this space of welcome and lost members when their white leaders began confessing the Christian church's racial bias and complicit participation in racial segregation, and the church made intentional steps in hiring staff and designing ministry practices that eventually led them to co-lead pastors, one black and one white, along with a fully integrated and diverse staff that spans the breadth of ethnic and racial diversity. Christian author, conference speaker, and church planter Jen Hatmaker took the risk and made space for welcome in 2016 when she publicly announced after years of prayerful and biblical discernment her belief that God's intention for covenant marriage extends to same-sex couples and took an open and affirming posture. And even though she received death threats from Christians and was released from her publisher and lost hundreds of thousands of dollars, she and her church continue to find ways to bless and welcome all people. Leaders of a Russian Orthodox churches located in France, the Netherlands, Ukraine, and even inside Russia, risk facing discipline this week and sanctions for responding to their bishop, Patriarch Krill's public support of Russia's terrorist invasion of Ukraine by recently removing his required name from the traditional place of the worship in the liturgy and refusing to utter his name within the confines of their ministry and their worship in hopes of showing their support and blessing for the Ukraine people. Inspired by a small group discussion, Luke Linden and his family partnered with a few other families from their church to offer hospitality and support to a recent refugee family from Afghanistan. As one of the supporting individuals said, we were worried this would require too much of us and would be too difficult, but we decided to take the risk. Sure, the language barrier and cultural misunderstandings abound, but love crosses the divide. We just remind ourselves we don't have to do it perfectly. We just welcome them as Christ welcomes us. And then this week, one of you, one of you took the risk 
financially and dropped off hundreds of dollars of gas gift cards to bless and support those in our community in need of assistance as we support Ukrainian neighbors across the ocean through various sanctions. A risk to welcome those in our community, to gather them together under support and care. So I wonder, maybe you do too, are we squatters with our own agendas, hostile to the hospitality, the blessing, the covenant God? <clears throat> or are we throwing out the welcome mat with our very lives, holding the largest space for the outsiders and the outcasts of our day? Are we taking the risk? And together, all God's people say, Amen. Please join with me in prayer. <clears throat> oh God, we may not be able to confront dictators or bring down terrorist nations. We may not have the authority to divert natural, national resources or to fight off invaders and uplift entire communities. We may not have the power to silence the noise of war, protect children facing trauma, bring back the dead, heal the wounded. We may not be able to confront these people in our lives, these situations, these places. But as we follow you, O oh Christ, give us the courage to do something, something, when we see that things are not as they should be, as you intended. Give us the courage to risk living our lives as your temple in this world, reminders of your blessing for all people. And so we pray that you would inspire us here to commit to and act on something we can do to make a difference in the coming days. May we bring peace through acts of gentleness and reconciliation May we bring care through small contributions and collaborations of our time, talent, and treasure. May we bring unity through words of support. May we bring encouragement through holding our tongues and our complaints. May we bring welcome through acts of gathering and acceptance. May we bring wholeness through acts of care and service. And in these ways, O oh God, may we make a big contribution to fulfilling your covenant to bless the whole world, all peoples. This morning, we specifically pray for that blessing to show up and to be seen in Ukraine. We pray for its people, the people living within its borders still and the people scattered now throughout the nations. We pray for the nations, communities, and organizations helping to care for and support these displaced Ukrainians and all refugees displaced from places like Afghanistan and Syria, Venezuela and Sudan. Bring within Ukraine and these places the miracle of peace, driving out those invading, lording over, terrorizing their land. We pray also for our community, closer to home, this place, these people. We pray for the needs of those among us in need of healing, peace, direction, comfort, and more. We are especially mindful of grief right now in the midst of Paul van Inglenhoven's passing. We pray for Vernie, Sally, Mary, and their families as they gather with friends to remember and to grieve well together, a life well lived this coming week. We lift up all these prayers for this great big world, a world you have placed us in to live out your covenant blessing. Help us to follow in your way to do this, to take the risk. And we pray in the prayer that Christ has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come.
your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We continue our response to God's gracious gift of this word by standing to sing together hymn number 710. We are called to be God's people. Let's stand as we praise God in this place. announcements. Uh, first, I begin the announcements with Mike. I'm wondering if you saw this like funny looking square on the back of the bulletin. I did. Is that like a puzzle or something? What is that? <laughs> well, for those of you who don't know, this is a QR code. I was so interested in the generational differences when last week Micaiah looked at the bulletin and she said, oh, QR code. We have these at school. And then there were probably others who looked at the bulletin and thought, well, what is that? So, this is one way that we are hoping to touch base with and know who is worshiping with us, especially guests, um, whether first time or multiple times, um, college students. So, if you are someone who has begun worshiping with us within the last six months to a year, um, or maybe you would have someone who's worshiping here who has updated change information or college students, we encourage you to use your phone camera to put it on here, and then you'll take you to our page where you can fill out some information, um, allowing us to just touch base with you if necessary or update your information. We're specifically hoping to touch base with those who are among us um, more recently, but it's open to all to use. If you still have no idea what I'm talking about, feel free to touch base with one of us, Elissa, who's back there. She is awesome and put this QR code together, so you can ask one of us and we'll help you. Um, also, our name tags are back out, plus you still have your name tags in your boxes. If you have a permanent name tag in your mailbox, we're encouraging you to remember to put that on each Sunday. If you don't and you need one, let us know. We'll make you one. And if you um, just would rather write up a quick guest name tag, you're welcome to do that as well, the one like I have on. There's stations up here and downstairs to do that as you enter the building every Sunday. Adult discipleship classes start today, so check out those. There's two on the back of your bulletin. We encourage adults to go down there about 1045 and join in those discussions. That helps build community together. And then finally, we have one more, right? 
Yes, we are in a month of listening and feedback around the RCA and also the consistory's sort of posture towards what the RCA is going through. Hopefully you'll have a chance to either email a consistory member or fill out a form, put it in the lockbox in the gathering space. Let us know your reflections and thoughts around this month of feedback. And keep in mind that feedback is specifically around the consistory's prayerful posture of patience. So it's not necessarily around all the things happening in our denomination. We want to know how you feel about the consistory's decision to be intentional and waiting uh, for the restructuring plan to come back. So please do uh, share that feedback. Uh, we continue our prayers, obviously, for the Van England Hoven family. Just updates in terms of um, the visitation will be held on Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon from 3 to 7 with the family present from 5 to 7 at the Ullman Funeral Home here in Orange City. Uh, so if you'd like to attend the visitation, that's Wednesday evening. And then the memorial service will be held Thursday morning here at American Reformed Church at 11 o'clock. Please join us in continuing to pray for the Van England Hoven family. We also invite you to continue to invest in the ministry and mission of American Reformed Church. There is a tithes and offerings lockbox in the box in the back. You may drop your gifts in there. You may also give online. You may mail your gifts to the church office. We are so grateful for your generosity to this congregation. And with that long list of announcements, may you go out into the world with these words first and foremost ringing in your ears. The love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you now and always. Amen. Amen.